All right. Um, so there we go. Uh, today I'm going to talk about making decisions that can be difficult in the context of open source uh, and through the lens of how when WordPress adopted automatic updates late last year. Um, the obvious one is that updates are important. Uh, I don't think that I need to stress this enough, but there are a few reasons why. Of course, a big one is security. That's an obvious one. We also want our users to be running what is the latest version of our software, whether it's the newest features, obviously bug fixes, and also just for pride reasons. We don't want them to be running old versions. Um, the other benefit to doing something like maybe automatic updates is a seamless experience for the user. Uh, when you think about it, what version of Chrome are you running at this point? You don't really know. In fact, you only know when it yells at you to maybe up, you haven't restarted in a while because you have 500 browser tabs all open. Or even like what version of Facebook do you run? Some of these things we don't even really get to, the, we don't even really talk about this anymore because it doesn't really matter. And in the context of even self-hosted software like WordPress, we don't need to be fighting with like what version you're running if we can make it a seamless experience. Now, uh, especially like in the context of maybe the indie web or something along those lines, where you want to be controlling your own content, you want to be hosting your own software, that doesn't mean that we still need to make it painful for users. Um, so way back in the day, uh, WordPress used to be updated through essentially through FTP. You would open up your FTP client, you would need to copy over all your files, you need to drop it in. I remember once inheriting a WordPress install that I needed to then run, and I didn't know at the time how to use FTP. Or rather, I didn't use it very often. And I didn't know at the time anything about WordPress. And I'm like, oh, crap, now I have to copy these files, but not these folders. And if I overwrite this, then I lose my theme. This is a problem. And this isn't solvable based on just maybe the directory structure, but it's a much larger issue of why should users need to go through this to maybe like supply a security update. Most people don't even know what PHP is. Forget about you know, how to then maintain all of this. Really, all they want is they want to be able to control and have their own web presence. So, uh, about maybe five years ago, uh, five, six years ago, we ended up adding this button in the, in the dashboard. And even before this button, we started doing things where we'd have an update check. And it would tell you that there was a new version available, but it wouldn't actually let you update to it. You'd still have to do it manually. Now, though, we, we finally got to the point where, okay, we can add this, uh, specifically a button that can go ahead and update all of WordPress. And soon after this, buttons came in very quickly for updating plugins, for updating themes. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't really a very good model, of course. First off, there are some issues here. Um, one of our philosophies, we have a number of core philosophies, and I'm going to talk about pretty much all of them today in this context. One of them is striving for simplicity. And our philosophies document on WordPress.org specifically uses updates as an example of how we've striven for simplicity. So the po it actually just goes on to describe that uh, we've taken ma major steps to make WordPress easier to use and to understand. Uh, and one of the great example of this is updates. Uh, so basically, updating was a painful manual task, FTP, whatever it might be. Uh, but what we decided to do instead was simplify it down to a single click. So this update automatically button, I mean, it's not very automatic, right? Like, it's not at all. In fact, it's update now, which is what we changed it to. It's a one-click instance. So the idea of an automatic update, we actually used to have a button that said update automatically. And now suddenly we have this issue where maybe like the, 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 the language changed. So now we talk about maybe this is what the current document says, that we made it so everyone could do a one-click upgrade. Now I love this example and I love the idea that we, ha I love the fact that we haven't yet changed the document because I can use it as an example in a talk. But also we, have this idea of we can strive for simplicity, and then we went beyond that, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, but for this particular point, um, now like a manual update is that button press. The FTP isn't even a factor anymore. And then the automatic update, it just happens automatically. So obviously, we can do better than this clicking a button situation. And so here's how we did it. Uh, we started by announcing that we were going to do it, which is not necessarily the best way to proceed on this, but it actually works surprisingly well. Uh, Matt Mullenweg, the founder of WordPress, he has a keynote every year, normally during the summer, at WordCamp San Francisco, which is our, really our annual conference. And during that keynote, he likes to sometimes like, drop a bomb on people, and hey, this is cool. So he decided a few years ago that we would merge two different versions of WordPress into one, and none of the lead developers knew it was happening at the time. This time, we all knew it was coming, at, the, at least. We had already talked about this. We had decided, you know what, we can finally do this uh, to the point where after years of dealing with all these auto update, all these 
automatic updates that was actually a button press, we, de we determined actually we have the experience to do this, we have the knowledge to do this, and at the same time, we also believe that we've, gotten, we've gained a quite a bit of trust in our users because it's gotten better over the years, and obviously it's good. If we just suddenly released an all new piece of software that had automatic updates built in, a lot of people would be like, whoa. And then they would see it's PHP, and they'd be like, whoa, because it's like a self-updating web application is kind of scary. And I imagine that some of you might be here because maybe it's scary to you as well, and you're wondering how in the world we did it, including some people in the back who are part of the WordPress community. So um, we continued after this announcement with, I was leading the release that implemented all of this. And we continued with a short, basically a short digestible blog post. It was maybe only about two or 300 words that basically described like, look, here's the plan. It was obviously, as you saw, it was announced. This is what we have to do. And here's the bulleted list of maybe like the eight different hurdles that we need to get through. These are the different tickets that we might need to adjust. Uh, these are the different things that we maybe we've even gathered over the years of how we're going to do this. Now, the benefit is that there was already a plugin that someone had written that implemented this in WordPress. So a number of people on the cutting edge were already using this, especially not for necessarily client sites. The classic example is the developer who also runs a bunch of sites for his friends or hosts a bunch of sites for his friends, and he doesn't actually trust his friends, or she doesn't actually trust his friends to, main, to click the update button. Maybe they don't blog very often. Maybe they're just like, oh, you do WordPress. Can you set me up with a blog and then don't use it? So they were already, a lot of people were already using this. Uh, in our case, though, uh, now this was a good start, and that person ended up being the, basically the, one of the two primary developers on the project, which is great. But it really wasn't enough. And so as part of this effort, we initially encouraged the, the community to have tons of conversations about this. There were a number of blog posts that people wrote on their own sites, on WordPress news sites. Uh, some other people in the tech press kind of started poking around. We had some people at Mashable who were kind of interested in this. Uh, and then also, I mean, obviously Twitter and Facebook and th those kinds of uh, venues are always going to be interesting. Uh, a lot of users who maybe aren't that actively involved in the community, but are like the kind of the troll in the support forums, they find this and like, oh God, what's going on? What we've tried to do is we tried to cultivate as much as possible all of this conversation because it's really important to actually understand what their fears are going to be. Uh, and we also, like, we knew we couldn't mollify everyone's concerns. We knew that going in, we would not be able to please absolutely everyone. But we felt like we were still making the right decision, and I'll explain why in a bit. Uh, and ultimately, we, we did, we avoided getting defensive because we felt like we could nicely try to explain what we were doing uh, in a way that you can't shove things down uh, your user base's throat, but if you get them to understand why it's happening, a lot more of them are going to be a little, uh, much happier about it. Uh, and so you guys have probably heard of the term FUD, uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And specifically, there were quite a number of fears for this. Now, FUD normally has a negative connotation in the sense that it is, oh, like, oh, it's security FUD. It's really just, it's crap. It doesn't, they're not really serious about it. But a lot of times it's not that. A lot of times it are, they are legitimate fears, whether it's, oh, man, my site will break or my plugins will stop working. Uh, I have a lot of these, just to warn you. Um, I, don't, I just don't trust you to do this well enough. And this was an actual quote. Um, or maybe I just don't trust you in general. Now this is not an actual quote, but the general idea of I don't trust you to do updates well enough or I just actually, I don't think this is a problem. I don't want to give WordPress too much access to my site. Um, or maybe it's, let's say, I don't want to lose any data. Where uh, is WordPress backing up before they do this? And the answer is actually no, which might scare people, but there's reasons why we're not. So at the same time, maybe some of the other fears, someone actually wrote this on my, on my post, by the way, bring on the mothership. Uh, someone else wrote exactly this. Uh, it feels like Big Brother. Uh, or maybe this sounds like Murphy's Law, which of course, yes, things can and will go wrong, and this was a major problem for us. Or maybe someone else is objecting that, uh, you're going to add a feature that I don't like, you're going to remove a feature that I don't like, but now what you're going to do is you're going to pull me into a WordPress version that I wasn't expecting. So how can we solve all these different problems? Uh, also, just the general idea of a self-updating application based on instructions from an API server, it can be a very dangerous situation on security. So how can we manage that? And then there are also the people who said, like, I work for a Fortune 100 company, or I work in government, or I work in the intelligence community. Uh, no, you cannot modify our stuff. And how can we prevent this right away? We must opt out, or this must be an opt-in. Uh, some other people, let's say, are managing their deploys in very particular ways. You might screw up my deploy process. You might wipe out my, my Git, my SVN directory in the process. Now suddenly I have no way of even knowing what the hell you just did because you removed my working copy. Uh, or in some cases, which is really cool, and this is, 
I don't even really get into this that much in the talk, but a lot of WordPress hosts over the last year and a half, two years, have started to push out updates automatically to all their users. So this wasn't really new to a lot of people because uh, Dreamhost and Bluehost and WP Engine, a lot of, I mean, a lot of these are just generic shared hosts, were already pushing new updates out to their users. So for the, a lot of times, people kind of already understood. And this was part of the groundwork that we were laying, where we could lay the groundwork of hosts already doing this, of us already doing this for six years, of a plugin that already is there to do it. Uh, and then there are some other questions that we didn't even know the answer to. Uh, will my site have downtime? I mean, if, you're, if it takes five minutes to do an update, now if you've ever done an update in WordPress, you've ever clicked a button, it can take four or five minutes. So how, much, how long is that site in maintenance mode for, where no one can access the front page? Uh, and then there are questions like this, please consider an opt-in. Or if they kind of read between the lines and knew we weren't going to do that, they would say, please consider an opt-out. Uh, and then what does that opt-out look like? I was at a conference before we released this, and someone said, uh, I explained it, and then someone, the question was, well, will there be an opt-out? Uh, opt like, will there, will there be something? And I said, well, I don't know. And they said, well, I, I don't understand. It's a, really, it's a yes or no question. I said, no, it's actually not a yes or no question. And I'll explain why. Uh, and this, of course, was also an exact quote. Like, this just sounds too risky. There is obviously a lot of risk here. The question is, what, how much risk is too much? If you saw my talk on Tuesday, a lot of this is balancing the burden of the user versus the burden of the software developers. If we can deal with the edge cases because we know about them, that's a lot better than the users dealing with the edge cases. So a number of our philosophies uh, are, are kind of really clever in the sense that, I mean, if the next version of WordPress comes with, a, comes with a feature that everyone's going to want to turn off immediately, we've kind of blown it, if you think about it. Like, that's just not good. Uh, and at the same time, you know, to take that further, any time that you add a feature that defaults to off, why bother adding that feature? Another thing to think about. Like, that it should be a very serious indication of maybe something went wrong. Like, WordPress should just work, uh, and, you know, if this is a new important enhancement, then it should just happen once they've go gone ahead and update. Uh, and there are some obvious concerns here of turning on new features. Any piece of software will turn on features over time that you may not want. Uh, there's also another of other issues with regards to one of our other philosophies is talking about the vocal minority, where there may be a large segment of people, especially actively involved in your community, the 90, the 100 people that are all saying like, this is a very, very bad idea, but they might not be representative of your entire user base. They might not, they might just be representative of the people who speak up, or especially in our case of the developers who can work around it because they know about it. Uh, ultimately, if, if it's important enough for us to add automatic updates for security releases to WordPress, why in the world would we turn it off by default? If it's actually important for us to go through the motions of having a security update immediately pushed to a site, like having that, hiding that behind the checkbox is just a bad idea. And I actually wrote once that it, was, uh, it would be the most egregious instances of open source of bowing to the pressures of a vocal minority uh, at the expense of essentially the vast majority of users. Which is true, and if you've, if you've ever seen some of, our different, uh, uh, some of our philosophies about maybe how you make proper user experience decisions and how you make proper UI decisions, this is a major issue. Uh, at the same time, one of the benefits of this, and to be very clear, uh, we're only doing this for minor releases, which a lot of people didn't understand at first. They said, oh my god, you might add this new feature and something might break and something will go wrong. Well, that's not actually what we were doing. What we were doing instead is dealing with, essentially, if you're familiar with some semantic versioning, we're dealing with patch releases only. We're not adding anything new. We're fixing a few bugs. We're fixing some security issues if there are any. That's all we're actually dealing with here. So, in this case, if we maybe have predictable major release cycles, in the sense that our deadlines are not arbitrary, we're shipping a new major version every four months. The last two releases, uh, four months to the day, every single time we hit it perfectly. Uh, and if we can take the update button out of users' hands for all of these minor releases, then suddenly all they need to do is they need to deal with the predictability of a major release every four months, and we could potentially even ship more minor releases. We don't need to maybe like hold back on that fix or that bug fix for another week or two to see if maybe any other bug fixes come through that we, bu uh, bugs come through that we might want to fix as well. So if we can we can ship them out, it eliminates what, what we would, what we normally would call the update fatigue uh, of pushing that button over and over again. At the same time, uh, one of our other aspects here is uh, one of our, uh, my favorite philosophy that we have is decisions, not options. And a lot of this was based on some early writings of a, of a GNOME contributor named Havoc Pennington, who's based in North Carolina. 
uh, from 2002, 2003, he wrote a number of blog posts specifically talking about uh, that preferences come at a cost for users. And at this point, given the technological ability that we have of pushing the, the update button for you for a security release, why would we put a checkbox there for you to turn it off? And this goes into maybe why would you want to turn it off? Maybe you want, might want to turn it off because it's your site and you don't really care. Maybe you want to turn it off because you're a developer and you can deal with it in other ways. Well, if you're a developer, you don't need a checkbox. In fact, that's more annoying. You would rather be able to do a line of code. That way you can deploy it across 100 sites rather than going into 100 sites and manually unchecking a checkbox. And I had to have an argument with the developer about how that was obviously going to be more painful for him. Um, and the, other, the flip side, the first one I mentioned of this Maybe, uh, uh, well, it's my site, and I, it's mine. Like, it, it doesn't affect anyone else. Well, that's not true. Because first off, WordPress power is 22.5% of the web at this point. It goes up pretty significantly every month. It's kind of scary. Uh, very scary, especially when we're doing automatic updates now. But it's not 22% of the web that we owe. We actually owe 100% of the internet to keep sites secure. If you're browsing the web on any given day, the chances of you stumbling across a WordPress site very fastly approaches one. Um, most major news sites are, power, are powered by WordPress in some regard, whether it's the Washington Post or the New York Times. Uh, pretty much every tech blog out there, uh, whether it's you know, any of the major ones, Mashable, TechCrunch, VentureBeat, all of them are powered by WordPress in some regard. Uh, anyone, even if you don't know what WordPress is, you're going to hit it. The last thing you want, especially, this is a great justification for the WordPress community, do you guys really want to be like the Android malware of the web? Like, that doesn't make any sense. So this is really a really good justification for actually, no, this isn't some software that you're running behind a firewall. You're running it in public. It, does make, it, does, it is a larger community aspect here. So we started, we continued our, our announcements forward by, uh, during the beta, the primary developer behind this, his name is Dion Hulse, based in Australia. He wrote the original updater previously as a Google Summer of Code project going back six years before this. Uh, and he published a, a very in-depth explainer on, okay, it's in trunk, it's in master, this is how it's implemented, let me walk you through all the different things that we do. And so I can explain to you now on how, basically how it works, and that WordPress says like, hey, there's a new update, uh, WordPress.org says this, and the API uh, can also do really clever things, like we can roll out updates with a delay. There's a lot of control there. Uh, so if we release a new version, we can wait maybe five or six hours to make sure that no one reports any problems with it before then turning on that auto-update flag. And we can even turn on that auto-update flag only for a certain number of sites to make sure that everything is good and that we can expand it. Or if for some reason maybe we're dealing with network capacity issues and we need to slow down the fact that we're literally shipping out a few hundred kilobyte zip file to oh, only about 50 million sites, uh, the load balancers might not be able to take it. So we can slow it down over time. Uh, we also must be able to communicate with WordPress.org securely, which sounds obvious, but there are some shared hosts out there that have problems with, let's say, OpenSSL not being there. Guess you're secure now from uh, GoToFail and Heartbleed and all of that if it's not even there at all. We have this problem where they can't communicate securely. So if they can't communicate securely, the API will automatically not return a, uh, an auto-update option. It will, however, do something like uh, say that, hey, you, know, you need to update, and it'll let you push the button. But we don't, the last thing we want is to risk a man in the middle for an auto-update, because that's a little scary. The site then determines if it can update to that version, if it should update to that version. So for some reason, the API ever offers something that it shouldn't, or in this case, the, the API actually offers all versions that it can update to. But if the site is restricted to only updating within that branch, for that particular patch release, and not for major releases, because users can turn that on. Uh, it's a way for the site to basically make sure, like, I got the right zip, right? The last thing you want is maybe for some stupid load balancing, caching issue somewhere along the lines, maybe not even on our end, that somehow caches two zips together, and then they're downloading the wrong version, and that could be really bad. So we also do some other really clever things, like we avoid running, on, we avoid running this at all on any server that we detect version control anywhere. It could be Git, Subversion, Mercurial, Bazaar, whatever. If we detect it anywhere on the server, we assume that you know better than we do, and we don't touch it. Uh, and this very quickly placated pretty much every, like a lot of developers' concerns, because they were really worried that they might break their own deployment processes. Uh, and of course, as I've been saying already, we only touch patch and security releases by default, which makes it really easy to justify saying, like, well, look, we're not actually worried about plugins breaking. We're really worried about uh, you know, us not copying all the files correctly. So when we download everything, we actually, before we even download the zip, we check to make sure we have enough disk space. Uh, and I will let you know that we have seen this error at least once. 
Um, and we only require like five megabytes of free space. So someone's doing something weird somewhere. Or it was us testing. I'm not really sure. Uh, and it downloads and verifies that we downloaded this proper package, making sure that everything is good. At which point, one of the smartest things that, that Dion did about six years ago is he made it so an instructions file was shipped with the package. So there's a file in WordPress right now, if you're running WordPress, that is never actually executed. Once it's there, it's not going to be executed. On the process of downloading the package and unzipping it, it copies that file into the place from the new package and then runs it. That way, we can offer some instructions for, uh, by the way, we might need to copy these files in a different way. Maybe a future update might need to make a certain adjustment, or maybe a future update can offer more defensive checks. And we can now ship that as part of a, of a file that's going to be executed. We also then figure out exactly which files need to be copied. And we do this essentially using checksums. So rather than copying over 1,500 files in WordPress, we can copy over 11. Now we're reducing file I.O. and those kinds of operations are making it a lot easier for this to ship. Uh, and then we confirm, it's actually more than three times, I recounted, it re I recounted it recently, that we copy these files fully. So we copy the file, we check to make sure it copied, we check to make sure that PHP claimed it copied, copy it again if it didn't, and then we also run checksums at the end to see if PHP ever lied to us, which happens. Uh, just to make sure that we're absolutely positively not screwing this up. And so if some files did copy and some didn't, we have what we call a critical failure. And early on in the process, we actually had uh, failure rates of about 10 to 20 percent of, oh, that's not good, right? That's very bad, in fact. Um, so what we, fo what we focused on really early is that good error data is really incredibly important. Uh, so right now, uh, the way it works is that the API, as part of the, this following update check, sends back essentially a small piece of almost like a crash report that describes exactly uh, what, what went into the check. So certain things like obviously error codes uh, and, and the data behind those, maybe what file in particular failed to copy over, or uh, what file system transport was used. Or uh, one of the other things also was time taken. So we now know that the average auto update only takes about four and a half seconds, not five minutes. Uh, that was very important because certain servers are going to be slower than others or faster than others. And so we ended up coming up with really uh, five different kinds of failure, or four different kinds of failure cases. So we have the success, and we have all these other ones where we have a transient failure, like, oh, a download didn't, didn't happen. Maybe uh, WordPress.org had said, hey, you can download this update. Ah, just kidding. We ran out of, you know, our load balancers are crammed. So in this case, we just reschedule it for an hour. That's simple. Uh, then we have these simple failures, and these are essentially like something failed early on. When we tried to unzip the file, uh, we couldn't, for whatever reason, copy everything over, or we did a, a, pre a pre-flight check to see if all the files were writable, and we found out that some of them were not. Uh, so in this case, we are like, okay, well, we'll retry the next version. Maybe something will change by then. Then we have these more complex failures where we started copying files, we think we finished, but then maybe like one other random thing happened, like we couldn't copy over the final versions file. So it even shows that they still have an update pending. But we know we didn't break the site in this case. So it's a failure, but it's not critical. And then these critical failures are when we started copying files, we don't know whether we finished, uh, and now we're only going to even retry when someone pushes that blue update now button and it works for them. Otherwise, we've essentially blacklisted that site. We're not even going to make the attempt anymore. Uh, and the benefit of this kind of very, very fine-grained control is that the, a, lot of, a lot of people were like, oh, you guys actually kind of know what you're doing here. We can, we can, I can trust you to implement this because this is how you've gone through with it. Uh, at the same time, we were only seeing maybe like 80 to 90% of our success rates. So we started looking around for more possibilities of failure, adding in different checks and seeing what error codes would come back. And as we added more error codes, like a pre-flight check, check of fire, files were writable, we realized that it went up, like these numbers went up really quickly. One of the other things that we did for communication purposes is that right around the time that we released the version that did all of this, I wrote a blog post that was literally link bait. Okay, this is clickbait right here. It was the definitive guide to disabling auto updates in WordPress. Uh, and the point of it really was not to tell everyone how to disable it, but rather, first off, we didn't want everyone to go really heavy handed. You can disable the entire automatic updater, but that also shuts it out of being able to update plugins and themes and translations and some other things. So we wanted to make sure that if you don't want it for this one thing, then turn it off this way. Don't go crazy and turn it off entirely or start deleting files or not update at all. And ultimately, it was just it was a fairly thinly veiled attempt 
to explain why you should trust it. And it walked through. For example, the very first, there were six ways that I outlined. The very first one was use version control because we obviously don't do an auto update there. So it was kind of like encouraging people to like, if you're doing the right thing, you're not gonna have a problem. So with WordPress 391, which is our most recent release, we did in the first 24 hours about 2.7 million updates, a uh, few tens of thousands of hour, uh, an, per hour. Uh, the real world chance of a critical failure, this is what we got it down to, was 0.004%. So that's 99.996%, that's four nines and a six. I'm not satisfied with that yet though. But if you actually do the math, that's only 99 problems. That's it, 99 sites out of 2.7 million had a problem with the update. Now, funny story, about 60 of these were because the readme file couldn't get copied over. So obviously that's not a big deal. In fact, no site on this, of this list of 99 actually broke. Because the way we do things is that we have, let's say, 99 files, or say we have maybe 10 files in a release, uh, none of them are cross-dependent. So we add a function in one, we call it in another. We don't do that in a minor release because maybe you might only get five of these files or six of these files. We don't want to risk breaking a site. So we're, trying to, we're working on this in a number of different ways. Now, at the same time, one of the other things we do is that as part of this process, we do a rollback. If we do get to a critical failure and we detected that we, went, we did something wrong, we try and roll back to the previous release, at which point we might get downgraded to just like a complex failure. It's not a critical one, it's just a normal one. Uh, it's one that we know your site didn't break because we were able to return to the, to the previous version. But for the 99 people who did actually, uh, for the 99 people who did actually get this critical failure email, this is what it said in it. Uh, it specifically said that we would be willing to offer you one-on-one -on -one support to fix your site to make sure this never happens again. Now, of course, this is really important on a PR standpoint. Uh, WordPress sends a number of emails, whether it's comment moderation or whatever it might be, this is the only email that is signed by the WordPress team. And some people pointed out, like, no, we don't do that for any other emails. I'm like, I know. But if they get an email that says their WordPress site has been successfully updated by some random person in their server, I would like it to be signed with the name of WordPress. It makes a lot of sense. It really helps with a lot of that trust. We want it to be as proactive as possible here. So we're so confident we're stamping our names on this. But the real benefit of this, this is totally deception. The real benefit of this is if you do take us up on this offer, we will be able to get a really good look at your environment to figure out why we have this problem. And this is how we're gonna get 99 down to zero. So by the end of this year, we will be 100% perfect on these updates. That's my goal. The nice thing is that update fatigue is no longer a problem because 98% of these releases uh, happened uh, through automatic means. Only about 2% of all people clicked the button. And that might just be because they clicked it before the, the API had a chance to let that site know that they need to update. Uh, and the other benefit too is that if let's say the site can't do an automatic update, which is probably about 15 to 20% of all WordPress sites for technical reasons, uh, the API uh, as a part of another flag can say, by the way, it's time to notify the administrator that they should update their site. So for a security release, this is maybe turned on by default. For a major release, maybe we'll wait a week or two to see if we shipped any major bugs in there. Uh, that kind of fine grain control was really important. So as part of our next steps when we were looking at all of this is that we really want to focus on research, on making the right choices and the smart choices for users. Uh, of course, there are some actual testing that we need to do and then there's educated guesses. Uh, so for us, of course, we want it to make it reliable. We want to make it stable and secure. And we want to make it so the user never needs to worry about any of these things. So one of the benefits of having a, an ecosystem with a lot of data, and this is very similar to, let's say, Firefox when they did automatic updates, is they know that maybe plugin A and plugin B run on 1,000 sites in harmony, or 10,000 sites in harmony. So chances are your site's gonna be just fine. So for us to eventually maybe do major releases, we have to start balancing all of this data that we have, whether it's plugin compatibility or favorites, or they run on this number of sites, and use that to our advantage, basically, to make an educated guess that your site is gonna be just fine if you go ahead and update. Uh, at the same time, we've also already been using this to push out security fixes for plugins. So even if you don't have plugins turned on, plugin updates turned on, which in, many, in most cases outside of maybe testing wouldn't make a whole lot of sense, uh, we're able to just set another flag in the API to go ahead and say, uh, update this plugin because it's, it's an insecure version. And we've been doing this very effectively to the point where there was a major plugin that's on a few million sites uh, and we were able to update uh, something like 80% of all of them within about 12 hours. So 
for a very serious vulnerability that was very trivial to, to compromise, we were able to pretty much almost entirely close that hole very quickly. Um, this was one of the reasons why I wrote this definitive post because I didn't want them to turn off the entire updater because then we wouldn't be able to do things like this. Uh, we can also now push out releases in minutes, which is a really cool aspect of the API. Uh, we now have uh, a bunch of load balancers with 10 gigabit NIC cards, which are really good. So we're able to probably push out uh, WordPress to pretty much everyone in the world within about, we're gonna try and get it down to maybe 30 minutes and maybe even quicker than that. So essentially every site, we can lower the time to live essentially, and instead of every site checking every 12 hours, we can tell them a few days in advance, hey, start checking a little faster, like DNS essentially. Uh, and we can also do other aspects of bringing ancient versions to the latest. So maybe in like four or five years from now when 3.7 is 10 major releases behind, we could ship out a final update to that release because we can actually still ship up security updates to older versions. We can ship out a final update to that release that essentially maybe like puts a giant box on the screen and letting them know that, hey, they're about to be updated to the next one. Because right now it's restricted, but maybe we just push them to 4.6 or whatever it ends up being. And you end up bringing all the, those previous ones to the front. Uh, this one is going to require a lot more trust in the community because at that point, if we decide to do this, this is why I'm talking about it very publicly now, especially in the WordPress community. I'm saying this is an option. That way maybe they're not nearly as surprised in the future. Uh, and we could also, maybe for actual testing, we could maybe like set up an actual sandbox environment. Or we could roll back in more scenarios, things of that nature. Uh, our ultimate goal is to update absolutely everything always as if you were on a hosted service. You don't need to be dealing with all this stuff. You shouldn't need to. If you're a developer and you want to, that's great. If you want to deal with complex dependencies, that's great. But for the cases of the vast majority of users that we have, the tens of millions, they don't need to worry about this and we don't want them to need to. So some lessons. Uh, the obvious one would be to communicate early and often to the point where we're already laying the groundwork now for potentially doing automatic updates for major releases. Or we really talked about the ideals of Chrome for two or three years worth of keynotes, the ideals of Facebook, of what version you're running for a few years. So when we finally did it, in fact, there was one particular WordPress news site that a year before we even attempted this already ran a poll, should WordPress do this? Like, it was, this wasn't a surprise to a lot of people. Uh, at the same time, you're going to need to uh, address concerns, but also cultivate them. You want people to raise as many concerns as possible. There were a lot of really good ideas in the comment thread that led to us being able to translate. They weren't technical suggestions, but we're able to translate those into particular technical suggestions to be able to do things like, hey, don't update if we find version control somewhere, because we didn't think of that case and this developer, for whatever reason, did. Uh, and then, of course, you need to focus on data analysis. And this isn't just beta testing and things like that, but if you're going to do anything crazy, you need some kind of informed piece of data. I remember talking with uh, some of the, the developers with Joomla. I was at their conference last year. And uh, we, I, they started talking about, like, what ver what's the minimum version of PHP you support? And I said, well, 5.2. And they said, really, we're 5.3 right now. We were thinking about doing 5.4. And I said, well, what's your usage like? And they said, we have no idea. So, well, that's not good. I can tell you that 5.4 is only 2% of our user base. 5.2 is a majority of our user base. And 5.3 is, is actually growing, even though it's end of life. Because people are moving 5.2 to 5.3 instead of 5.2 or 5.3 to 5.4. So, little, like, they had no idea. They were like, uh, we, don't, we don't collect that. We don't do anything like that. And I was like, well, we have for about seven years now. And that way we know exactly what that market looks like and we can make much better decisions. And in the case of updates, uh, the funny thing is that there were so few failures, there was only maybe 100 failures per release, 99 failures per release, that we didn't get enough data back to be able to eliminate them entirely. Before we even made our first major release ship, we were able to reduce all of the common failures that we could possibly find and get them down to the point where now we're dealing with like the, the, final, uh, the final crumbs in the bottom of the bag. Uh, and of course, uh, for me, I think that making decisions not options is a very important thing. Uh, I would strongly encourage it, ometer.com, letter O, meter.com. Havoc Pennington, read some of his early essays on free software UI, on making decisions and not, not, not succumbing to user preferences. Uh, if you've used something like Chrome and you go into preferences, it's much, it's like two panels. Or you go into Firefox, it's about 13. Or if you've ever maybe used a chat program like Adium, let's say, on Mac, it has like the, an advanced tab on the advanced tab. 
because it's an open source project and they just throw everything in. Compare Microsoft Word to Open Office. A lot of open source projects have this problem where they can't actually make the decision for the user and they just toss it off to the user to make the decision for them. And that kind of flexi flexibility doesn't make sense, especially if you have the ability to offer a, a rich API and extensions and if you have this plugin framework, whatever it might be, that's going to go a really long way as well. And ultimately, do what is best for your users, even if you're maybe hearing that it's not. Uh, in our case, there was a fairly large vocal minority that was saying, like, they, I, w I don't actually remember too many people. There wasn't like an entire riot of people. But certainly, they were very much saying, like, I don't know if this is a very good idea. I certainly don't want it for myself. And for us, it was like, OK, well, I think we can prove to you that it's a good idea. And I also agree that it's not for you. That's fine. It isn't a feature for you. It is a feature for 99% of the users of WordPress. And once we were able to convince them of that and they realized, oh, you're right, this doesn't apply to me and this totally applies to my clients, then they started to realize, okay, this actually is what is best for your users. So with that, I think I have a few, times for, few time for questions. Uh, my name is Andrew Nathan, the developer of WordPress. Uh, you can reach me probably on Twitter or a bug report are the two best ways to get a hold of me. Other than that, uh, I would love any feedback or questions that you might have. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Quite, quite serious. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that one. <laughs> Any questions or accommodations? I can pass them along to the people who, who worked mostly on this. So up until, up, up until now, when you rolled this out, you never had a case that you're aware of of your auto updating something on the client, right? Yeah. Yeah. We had a few cases where they were like, you broke our site. And I was like, really? Because your site's still running an older version and we didn't send instructions. Like, my, my, I'm running 3.6. I said, well, we definitely don't have the ability to do it in that version. It didn't come until 3.7. Uh, or in some cases, we actually tracked it down to a hosting company that was doing an update and ended up breaking things. So I am, we don't know of any. I guarantee a site has broken. It's just, I mean, the, the law of averages, say, uh, something broke somewhere. But as of right now, we don't know of anything. And obviously, we have a long way to go before I could say, yeah, no, this is totally fine. Um, but obviously, like a self-updating PHP application, we can only do so much. And we're actually encouraging a lot of the hosting companies to do this instead. I would rather the hosting company, which obviously has systems level access, to verify that they can do the update rather than us doing it. Uh, but that requires a lot of partnerships with some hosting companies that we just don't have. Sure. When you started rolling out, I guess, seven years ago, the WordPress phone or whatever, mm -hmm. did you get negative feedback about that? I did not because I was not around yet. Um, know, yes, absolutely. So it's actually not a bunch of system information. We literally only collect at the moment uh, PHP version, MySQL version, and what language you're using, and obviously what WordPress version you're using. And we do that to. to yeah, the language, yeah, the, the, yes, exactly. Spoken language that's chosen uh, in the dashboard. And for that, the reason is because we need to make sure that we're giving them the right package based on, well, you can't get this new version because it's not actually compatible with this version of PHP or something like that. Uh, there was a lot of complaints, uh, some obviously very legitimate. There are, of course, privacy concerns here. Uh, at the same time, we just did it, and it ended up being okay. And not many people turned it off. Uh, and for the most part, in this case, like, uh, it ended up putting us in a far better place. And obviously you will always have, especially in open source, you'll always have people who like to wear tinfoil hats. Uh, but a lot of them who are more pragmatic are going to realize that it makes a lot of sense. We also push all of this data into the open too. There's a whole API for it. So if you wanted to get a good idea for it, it helps. Uh, when I talked at a PHP conference last year, we ended up doing an opt-in crawl of some other sites to get much more detailed system information. And I was able to basically present to PHP core developers what the, what the actual ecosystem looks like because they have no idea, but we do have some of this data. So that, that helped out a lot as well. I, will, I can email you some of the old mailing list threads. They're public, they're great. Or Siobhan, who's doing a book on the history of WordPress, can show, her, show you her chapter. <laughs> yes? Mm -hmm. Yes? So it is actually possible for Drupal to do this if they did it only for minor release updates, right? If they only did it for, no, 
actually right now they add stuff in a lot of the minor release updates. So uh, for Drupal 8, what they're doing is they're splitting out their, their into proper semantic versioning where they will have that bug fix or their security fix update. In that case, they hypothetically could do this. However, in Drupal's case, the vast majority of Drupal installations, uh, for which there are obvious, there are far less than WordPress, are catered more towards enterprise, government, the higher end, which, I mean, running a Drupal site pretty much requires being a developer. So you end up not really needing this as much because there's already a lot of maintenance aspects that need to go into it. Uh, that said, uh, my talk on Tuesday was about the extreme portability of WordPress in the sense that we are backwards compatible from version to version. So simple answer, absolutely. Um, but it's a very big different, it's a very big difference in the paradigms of the two pieces of software in the sense that uh, Drupal might spend three or four years on a release, basically rewriting everything and breaking everything. We might spend, we might do 12 major versions in three or four years and don't break anything, but in those 12 versions end up rewriting everything. But we do it in a way that's much carefuler or we try not to actually break things. It definitely, like, sometimes you feel like your feet are in cement, but we've gotten really good at walking with our feet in cement. I don't know if I would ever run 100 plugins. It is. It, is. it, it isn't normally as common. You can get to that point, but normally sites aren't, it's not as sprawling of a, of a, of a code base in that regard, that you might not have, you know, 100 plugins, including, like, 17 or 25 or 55 contrib modules. A lot of it's built into the core software. So it really depends, but generally speaking, no, you're gonna have far less trouble with updates on WordPress than you will with Drupal. Ultimately, when you're dealing with Drupal, you're adopting like Drupal 6 or Drupal 7 or Drupal 8. With WordPress, you're not really adopting the version number because you're on that same track and you're, you don't need to get off of it. A few more time, a few more minutes for questions, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I mean, are you talking more about like sandboxing, for example, or? Um, it's like walking on a tightrope. So essentially, we're normally, in, for, for example, we're not changing function definitions. Um, we're introducing new functions and deprecating the old ones. Uh, we do some, I, I don't know how familiar you are with PHP, but we can do really, you can do some really cool things like take an associative array, like a list, let's say, and convert it to an, an object that also can be accessed like an array. Um, you know, JavaScript, essentially. Uh, and that way we can, let's say, that object can then be more performant. It can lazy load some things, things like that. But it still can be accessed in the old way nicely. Um, ultimately, it ends up being a lot of work, but it's also very worthwhile because we wouldn't be nearly where we are without any of that. Certainly. In fact, before we make changes, before we might deprecate a, fu a function or something like that, uh, we have the entire, a lot of us have the entire plugin directory also mirrored on our computer. So we can just very quickly like act or grep right through it um, to the point where it's like 11 or 12 gigabytes of PHP. It's a lot of PHP. But we're able to search through it and say like, is anyone actually using this plugin? Now, if n uh, this function, if no one is, someone still might be in private code, obviously, which makes a lot of sense. But it can give us a really good indication of how they're using it, whether anyone's been using it wrong. Uh, no one would ever use that function this way, you say. And then you look at it and you realize, yes, they do. So uh, that kind of happens as well. Daniel. It wouldn't be a question from Daniel if it wasn't. <laughs> Uh, that will be significantly more difficult. I think that we will get first automatic updates for major releases of WordPress core before we start to even talk about plugins. Uh, the first step for plugins would probably be something like a, an opt-in on the basis of the plugin developer and on the basis of review. So for example, when we ship right now a fix for a malicious plugin that's going through the core security team and being approved by the lead developers. So they can't just like say we have this. No, actually we're testing their fix, validating it, and then locking down the zip that we're serving out rather than having them being able to randomly modify code and ship it out. Uh, there are a lot of other concerns there as well. 
Um, there's security concerns of, let's say, plugin authors and whether they are, they are malicious or we've had people like sell their plugin to someone else and then suddenly it becomes like a thing of spam. So there's a lot of issues there. I think that first we need to learn uh, how we're going to deal with major releases. And also, we're also doing translations now too. So all WordPress translations automatically get updated on the fly. They don't even need to worry about it. Uh, and we're going to, I think, learn a lot more over the next few years about how we can get this to work beyond that. For plugins, I would like to make it so you can just like maybe like click an update all and it'll automatically resolve the various dependencies and it'll say, yeah, I'll update everything that I know is compatible, something like that. And that would be like the first step in a multi-year process to get it so everything could just update. It seems like a very admirable goal of people I really love being able to say that I don't know. And at the same time, five years ago, if you said like WordPress should do this, like it was an ideal five years ago, but no one ever said, yeah, we can do that t tomorrow. Um, but we also, we pressure each other on these all the time. Like uh, Matt asked me uh, before we just did the, the most re recent major release, he said, do you think we could turn it on for major releases yet? And I was like, no, unfortunately, we won't be confident enough. But it's a great thing to continue to talk about because then once we finally do do it, everyone's like, oh yeah, of course, like WordPress does this. And now it's, 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 a, it's a thing. Everyone like, loves the fact that, especially if they run a lot of sites, that they're getting like 30 successful emails at the end of it or whatever it might be. So it's a very, obviously there's a lot that needs to happen, but I like to put it there as a goal to see if we can get there and then figure out how we can solve these problems. Because ultimately, this isn't just like a cool problem to solve, but it's incredibly important. Otherwise, I mean, it will become, and it is in many ways, too difficult as a user to run a WordPress site. And all they're gonna end up doing is they're gonna migrate to some hosted service, and then obviously they lose a lot of control there as well. So it's at the very least like having goals and having philosophies is more important than maybe being able to do them because you'll always be able to have something to strive for. With that, you guys only have about 10 minutes now, I think, for the next session. If you guys have any other questions, please find me or talk about WordPress or anything else. And thank you guys very much. Really appreciate it. <laughs>